My wife and I celebrated our 10-year anniversary in December. I was so pumped. We made it. We made it to this awesome milestone. Here's a picture of us. Uh, this is from a backpacking trip a couple of years ago, but we finally made it to this awesome milestone. I knew her for about a year before uh, we got married, and I'm an awkward guy. Let's just be honest. I'm weird, okay? I got some quirks, and so she's put up with my awkwardness for 11 years now, okay? And my pursuit of her was just as awkward as my own character. It began when we worked at the Sizzler together, and I would leave her little notes on her vehicle. I, I was enamored with her. She's beautiful. She's smart. She loves Jesus. She's so kind. And I'd leave little notes on her car. And sometimes um, they would kind of border on like stalker-ish ransom letters. Like there was, there was some gray area there. I'm pretty sure if she turned some of those notes into the police, I'd be in a very different place in society right now. But she liked me back. And so I continued to write notes and leave them there to, to woo this girl out that I was way too afraid, afraid to talk to. Um, but the thing is, the guys at my work, they caught on to my little scheme. And what they would do is they would go out to her car and they would read the notes. Sometimes they'd bring them in and share them with others. And so it was so embarrassing, but I didn't care. Like, I am after this girl. She's going to be mine. And eventually I mustered up the courage and asked her on the first date. We got to our first date, and I, sh I chose dinner and a movie. I thought, low bar, like, we're going to be okay. I'm terrified of this girl. I want to marry her. Like, so low bar, we're going to be all right. We don't even have to talk in the movies, right? But what I had forgotten is that dinner requires dialogue. Like, you got to talk to each other. And so we sit down, and I'm like, oh, no. What word should I say? I don't have any. Oh, no, what do I do? And the waitress comes over, and she's this really bubbly, fun, extroverted personality. And she's connecting with me and connecting with my wife. And, and we're laughing and giggling. And I'm like, okay, good. This is how it's going to be. It's going to be easy. But then the waitress leaves, and I'm like, wait, no, come back. I, I don't know how to do this without you. Right? And we sat there for an hour and said maybe all of five words. And then when the waitress brought us our food, there were these huge portions. She had... Uh, she had nachos and I had a quesadilla. I can picture it like it was yesterday. Nachos and a quesadilla, huge portions, and we didn't eat any of it. We were too scared to eat in front of each other. And I remember as we were leaving, I got to check and the waitress looked at Shaughnessy and said, um, honey, do you need a box? And she's like, no, I think I'm okay. And she's like, are you sure? Are you okay? Like, is this guy a creep? Like, what's going on here? Neither of you have eaten any of this. And they tossed it all away. We were too terrified to eat in front of each other. So I, I went through embarrassment at work. I went through uncomfortable situations. But it all culminated when I had finally decided I'm going to propose. Right? So I, I took her parents to a Mexican restaurant. Um, and we, we sat down and I said, here's the reason I have you here. I, I want to marry your daughter. She's awesome. And Colleen, my mother-in-law, just starts bawling, like tears, water falls out of her eyes. And then James, my father-in-law, he starts crying too. And they give me their blessing. And we make kind of this plan about how I'm going to propose to her. Her uncle is a professional musician. And he travels the country and he writes cutesy, lovey-dovey songs that are kind of awesome. And one of, his, one of his songs is actually kind of our relationship song. And so we came up with the idea, what if I propose to her at one of his shows? I was like, that is so romantic. That is awesome. I like, guess she, there's no way she'll say no, right? So he was traveling uh, to Bend to play a concert, and we went over there, and we had set it up with him. He was going to give me a cue, and we get to the show that night, and I am I'm terrified. I have memorized the speech that I want to say. I have it written down just in case I forget it, and when we get there, um, there's like 250 people in the room. And I'm freaking out, right? What if she says no to me in front of 250 people, right? Like that would be, this story would be really depressing if, if that were true, but she didn't. So we get up there and um, Tyrone says, I've got a very special guest for, here today. I want him to come to the stage. And I get up there in front of all of these eyeballs and I'm terrified. Now, it is a cosmic joke that I am a public communicator because crowds freak me out. And so I get up there and Tyrone was a tall dude and his microphone was like above my head. 
And I remember I looked up to his microphone and I was spoken to it. I said, uh, can I have Shaughnessy come up here? Like nobody in the room knows who Shaughnessy is. They don't know the context. They have no idea what's happening. This is super weird. Shaughnessy comes up to the stage and I turn away from the microphone because I just couldn't handle looking at all these eyeballs. And I look at Shaughnessy and I said, seven words. I got seven words into my speech. You know how I always tell you. I got that far and then everything in my mind went out the window. I have no idea where I was going from there. I forgot that I had the speech written down and I was turning beet red, just totally publicly humiliated. In fact, the guitar player was right behind Shaughnessy for her uncle's band and he just starts cracking up laughing and he's pointing at me like, this dude needs to get it together, right? And so I just like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? Uh, drop to the knee and show the ring. That's what you got to do, right? That's going to convince her. So I drop down, show her the ring. And sure enough, she said yes, right? But I was willing to pursue her regardless of what it costs. Public humiliation, embarrassment, uncomfortable situations. Regardless of the cost, it was worth it to me. The goal of the pursuit was worth the cost of the pursuit. Today, we're going to look at the greatest pursuit in the history of the world. That's God's pursuit of you. We're going to look at the lengths that Jesus went to to pursue relationship with you and what he's done to make that possible. And I want to just pause for a moment here. Probably all of us have heard the story of Easter. We've probably heard, at least in some vague context, that, that Jesus died and he rose again. He came back to life. And that in that, we can find forgiveness of sins. We probably all know that story. But here's my question. Although we know the, the Easter story tells us that God loves us, are we experiencing the love of God? Although we know that the Easter story tells us that we are forgiven, are we experiencing the creator of the universe forgiving our sins? A holy God forgiving our sins. And although we know that the Easter story reveals that God wants relationship with us, have we really experienced friendship with the creator of all? You see, knowledge is not enough. Knowledge is important. It's just not complete. Knowledge finds its ultimate end in experience. God wants us to experience relationship with him. He's not just a topic to be studied. He's a person to be known. So today, we're going to lean into that. Jesus describes his pursuit of us this way. Luke 9, 22 says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. And this word here, suffer, that word in the Greek, the Bible wasn't written in English originally. This passage was written in Greek. And that word in the Greek is pasco. And pasco has been translated from the Greek to Latin to French and then into English. And it's actually our modern word, passion. So literally, he's describing his passion for us. Passion is a love so strong that it's willing to suffer for its beloved. This is a passionate pursuit. A passionate pursuit. Last week, we looked at the trials of Jesus, that he went through these religious trials and then some Roman trials, and the verdict was guilty, and the penalty was death by crucifixion. And during this time, he's beaten by soldiers whose job it was to execute him. Their job was to execute him, but they didn't need to be so cruel. They, they beat him by shoving a crown of thorns into his skull. The thorns would have been about three inches long. And they, they give him a staff that they ended up beating him over the head with. And then they put a robe on him and he had lacerations all over his back from being flogged. And then they ripped the robe off, reopening wounds afresh. Jesus has been publicly humiliated. He's been ripped. His beard has been ripped out. He's been spat on. He's been mocked. And now he's walking towards his ultimate sacrifice for us, death on a cross. And he hangs there for six agonizing hours. And there's a couple of amazing things that happen while Jesus is hanging there. And that's why I want to sit today. I want to focus in on those things. 
In Luke 23 is where we're going to be today. It says, as Jesus was uh, being executed, it says, two other men, both criminals, were led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the place of the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus, the son of God, the innocent one, is treated as though he is a common criminal. It goes on, it says, as he's hanging there on the cross, he's looking down at his executioners, the ones who just pulled his arms out of socket to nail them to the cross and who put nails through his feet and who had been beating him earlier. He looks down at them, the executioners, and what are they doing? He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what, they, they don't know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. They're down there trying to profit off this guy's execution. They're gambling for his clothes. There's no iota of repentance in their hearts. Jesus looks at pure evil, cruelty. They know that he's an innocent man, and yet they still continued to execute him. And his heart is, what? Forgiveness? I can't fathom that. This is the heart of God. Now, those men didn't see their need for forgiveness. They didn't repent. They didn't trust in Jesus. They don't have a relationship with God. We don't see that happening in the story. But Jesus' heart, he was willing to forgive his executioners. Here's what I want us to see. Jesus died to forgive us. Jesus died to forgive us. He sees these men in this wretched state. And he says, Father, forgive them. A wretched state in his heart is rescue. Several years ago, uh, my father and I, we took our first backpacking trip. It was awesome. We went up into the Wallawa Mountains and we went to a place called Ice Lake. Here's a picture of us more recently. In that first year, we had no idea what we were doing. Um, we brought way too much gear. Our packs were way too heavy. We didn't have the right supplies that we needed. And but we were stoked. We were all super excited. And we get to the lake and there's these two trails around the lake. One trail went to the left and the left trail was super marshy. We didn't have the right shoes, so we didn't want to go that way because we'd get stuck. But the other trail uh, that went around the right side of the lake, it was on the side of a mountain. And it was just shale rock that was, went straight down into the lake. And the lake was still partially frozen over in spots and if you were to go into that water, you would die. This you would, 100 pound pack on your back, all your gear on, you're in freezing water, hypothermia would kick in, it would be over for you. And so we decided we're gonna take the right hand trail, but there was a problem, we couldn't see all of it because part of it bent back into the mountain and then came back in. And so we get going and about halfway through, we get to the part that bends back in the mountain and there's a problem. Right in the middle of the trail, there's a 20-foot snow drift. There's no way below it, and there's no way above it. And if you were to slip and fall on that snow drift, the probability that you would then slide into the lake and die is very high. And so we get to the snow drift. We have no crampons, no spikes for our shoes. My dad was the only one who had trekking poles. And we're like, okay, we're going to take this one at a time, slow. And so my dad's friend, Darren, kind of makes a little path across the snow drift and he gets to the other side and he's successful. And then my dad's up next. And dad, he begins walking across. He gets about halfway through the drift and his feet go out from underneath him. All of his gear on and he begins sliding quickly down towards the water. He grabs, in the last minute, he grabs onto a piece of ice, but it won't last long. There was absolutely no way he could rescue himself. He needed somebody outside of himself to come and rescue him. And in an instant, my dad's friend Darren runs to the middle of the snowdrift at extreme risk to himself, reaches down, grabs my father's hand, and pulls him up to safety. If it, if he was, if it was not for this act of heroism, my father would not be with us today. That's Jesus' heart for unrepentant sinners in this moment. That's Jesus' heart for us. 
that he wants to extend grace. We have to respond to it. Yes, they didn't respond to it, but he wants to extend grace. He wants to extend forgiveness to us. And it's easy to know this. Probably everybody has heard that your sins can be forgiven in Jesus. But the question we're at wrestling with today is, have you really experienced it? And as I was thinking through um, how do you experience God's forgiveness, I, I remembered a moment that was really profound for me. Several months back, I was talking to Pastor Will at the Green Campus, and I just told him, I feel like I'm carrying a backpack full of shame around with me. You see, I've got baggage. I, I'm a recovering addict. I've got baggage. There are people that I put in dangerous situations. There are people that I've hurt. There are people that... Um, never want to talk to me again because of the things I did in my active addiction. I got baggage. And I told him, I feel like I'm carrying a backpack full of shame. And he said, well, I have an idea. What if every week we meet and every week you just tell me one, one story that's in that backpack you're carrying around. And then together, we can confess those things to God and to each other. And maybe that will help you process this. And I, we met for four or five weeks where I just unloaded story after story of brokenness and sin. And there was one in particular that was the greatest shame of my life. And as I told Will that story, I expected rejection. But after I was done and I'm sitting there crying, he looks at me and he says, you know, God forgives you because Jesus died for that sin on the cross. That's been taken away from you. You don't have to carry that anymore. And it was this profound moment where, where I received forgiveness for the first time. Not because Will could offer me forgiveness, but because I had somebody outside of myself reminding me that forgiveness doesn't come based on my performance. It comes from the gospel. It comes from the grace of God in Jesus Christ, dying on the cross and rising again. It was this profound moment for me. If we want to experience forgiveness, we need to be willing to bring our forgiveness to God. Be real about it. That's the only place we can find forgiveness. And then I'll add something to that. James, the book of James tells us that when we confess our sins to one another, there is healing that takes place. We need both. So here's my question for you. Have you brought your brokenness to the surface? It's so easy to want to hide. I, that is my tendency. I want to hide because I don't want you to know what's really going on in here. Because if you really know the deepest, darkest things in my heart, I believe you'll reject me. You won't love me. And what I really believe is if God really knew, he wouldn't love me. But the reality is the Lord knows and he still went to the cross. That's how much Jesus loves you. And I don't know if you're here today because uh, somebody invited you. Or, or a friend forced you to come or tricked you, said they were going to go get food and they like show up at the church with a hot pocket for you. Like, I don't know why you're here, but I do know Jesus wants to extend grace to you. He died to do that. And it requires a response. It requires placing your trust in him, surrendering your life to him. You have to be willing to bring that brokenness to the surface. We are all broken. And I want Family Church to be a place where it's okay to not be okay. That it's okay to talk about the brokenness in our lives because as we bring that to God, we find forgiveness. And as we bring that to our brothers and sisters in Christ, we find healing. We have to stop hiding. Have you brought your brokenness to the surface? The story continues. It says, as he's hanging there on the cross, remember, there's two criminals be, uh, on either side of him. It says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save us and yourself. He says, look, dude, prove yourself to me. 
You say you're the Messiah, show us. Come on, man. Like, I'm in a predicament here. You could help me out. And I love this. The other criminal says, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. He said, we deserve death. We are sinful. We're wrong. We, what we've done, we've earned this punishment. We're punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, Jesus, he's done nothing. He's done nothing. He's innocent. This, this other criminal, he knows, he has a right estimation of himself, and he has a right belief about God. He knows that he is guilty and he deserves this and that Jesus is innocent. And then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I want you to feel this moment. They're hanging on a cross, which forces the body into a state of constant inhalation. They can't breathe out. So their breathing is like, (gasps) 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 they can't let air out of their lungs. In order to exhale, they would have to push up against the nails and the weight of their body to let air out. This is an important conversation. It is costing both the thieves and Jesus excruciating pain. And think about this. The criminal who hurled insults at him, he went through excruciating pain to belittle the Son of God. And here this other criminal says, when you come into your kingdom, I know I'm, I'm a sinner. I know I justly deserve this. I know you're innocent and you are a king. Please remember me. And Jesus pushes up against those nails so that he can exhale and let air go over his vocal cords to say this. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. And here's what I want you to see from this. Jesus died to befriend us. Now don't take my word for it. Let's go back to the passage. Here's what he says. Truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now often the the word in that passage that gets all the play is paradise, right? It conjures up images like this, of like a beautiful tropical scene. We got palm trees and pristine ocean and white sandy beaches, a place for you to hang on a hammock. Like that's the part that always gets all the play. I want to be in paradise. But that's not the most important part of what Jesus says. There's two words that are the most profound thing in that sentence. Here's what he says. You'll be with me. Jesus offers himself to this guilty criminal because he understands who Jesus is. And in this act of faith, remember me. He says, yes, you're going to be with me. You're going to be in relationship together. Jesus offers friendship to a guilty sinner. This is amazing. And honestly, for me, when I was wrestling through this, I thought, isn't it like blasphemous to say that we could be friends with God? Like God is the sovereign king of the universe. How could I be friends with him? And as I did some study on this and read some commentaries, because I was really wrestling with it, I came to the conclusion that if the sovereign king of the universe extends you friendship, it doesn't belittle him. It just magnifies his grace. Like it reveals his grace. In this moment, he's showing what grace really looks like. That the sovereign king, holy, righteous, and just extends friendship to a guilty criminal. Jesus died to befriend us. Now think about, think about the pursuit of my wife earlier. What if after uh, she said, yes, I'll marry you. If I just like, okay, cool, kick back. She's going to take care of me. I'm not pursuing that woman anymore. She better really work hard to please me. What if my pursuit of her stopped? That would not go well for me. Like my marriage would be in tatters. 
Jesus didn't stop pursuing us on the cross. It continued to the resurrection and it continues today. Right now, he's pursuing you. The question is, how are you responding to his pursuit? Again, if you're here and you don't know Christ, he desires friendship with you. He desires to extend forgiveness to you. Not because you're so great, but because of his great sacrifice. He wants you. What will your response be? Jesus died to befriend us. Will you accept his friendship? John, uh, the book of John says it this way. Jesus is talking and he says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for his friends. He calls us friends. That doesn't belittle him. It just magnifies the beauty of his grace. And what will your response be? You see, Jesus goes in to the cross and he's hanging there. He hangs there for six hours. He has this interaction with the soldiers on the ground and with the criminals on either side of him. And this is a dark day for those who know and love Jesus. The women are watching at a a distance as their friend, their relative, somebody that they love is being publicly crucified. This is a dark day. And after six hours, um, the earth goes dark, the rocks are rent, the temple curtain tears, and Jesus dies. And it seems that the battle is lost. They've taken care of the threat of this leader, this leader of the, of the movement of following Christ. They've taken care of Jesus. He's no longer a threat to the Roman government. His, his followers have scattered. All of the men are now hiding. They're terrified for their own lives. And for three days, he's in the tomb. People have, his friends have accepted defeat. They had forgotten what he said, because although it looked like a loss, this is really how Jesus won the war. The story doesn't end with a tomb filled with a body. And I love this. Continuing on in Luke 24, it says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So they go there, they're expecting, they bring spices, which was a traditional thing to prepare a body for burial. They're expecting to find the body of Jesus. They get there and they're dismayed as this huge stone is rolled away. The guards are knocked out and Jesus' body is missing. Like this is such a, this is adding insult to injury. Not only is he dead, but now we can't even properly grieve him. It continues. It says, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Why do you look for the living among the dead? Jesus is alive. Why are you here looking for the living among the dead? He's alive. He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you? While he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. This is Jesus' decisive victory over death and sin. Right? It looked like for three days the battle was lost, and now there's an empty tomb. He's overcame sin on the cross. He took all of our sin upon himself, dying so that we could find forgiveness, and then three days later he rises again, defeating death. This is a decisive victory, but it doesn't look like it to his friends. 
And they had forgotten. They had forgotten the power of God. They had forgotten that Jesus said, I have power over death. It's not the final defeat anymore. And here's what I want you to see. Jesus died to free us. You see, just like they forgot, we often forget. Just like they forgot about the power of God to overcome death, we often forget. We often forget where the power of God to overcome the sin in our life comes from. And often we try and wrestle ourselves free. But you're no match, and I'm no match for our own fleshly desires and sinful desires. We're no match for the powers of hell and the temptations therein. There is one, though, and his name is Jesus, and he has the decisive victory. And he died to set us free. And the death of Jesus and the resurrection is the evidence of our freedom. Continuing on, the women, they freak out. They bow their faces to the ground in the face of these two robed figures that say, hey, remember, he's not dead. He's alive again. This is where the power comes from. A couple of uh, days ago, I was actually last Saturday, I was taking a nap, right? I was introverting hard. And I get up from a nap and I come out into the living room. My kids were doing something so sweet. They were cleaning up the house. They know that we're moving down to South Umpqua, which by the way, church, I'm so excited. And that because we're uh, moving, that we have a lot to get, you know, go through and decide what we want to keep. And, and so they were trying to help out. And uh, I come out and I, I look to the far end of the house. I can see straight into the, the guest bathroom. And my two daughters are in there on their knees by the toilet. They have hand gloves on and a trash bag. And I'm like, what is happening? And Asher said, Daddy, while you were sleeping, the toilet clogged. But don't worry, the girls are taking care of it for us. And I freaked out. I ran back there. No, no, no. Don't touch that. It's poison. You can't. You're going to get sick. We need to go wash your hands for like 45 minutes. Like, this is not okay. This is not how we take care of this. It goes down the drain, not out of the drain. Because they were sitting there with the gloves on their hands, grabbing, you know what? This is them right there, the cuties. But they were covered in Yes, I'm not going to say the word, but here's a picture for you. And no, that's not chocolate ice cream, okay? It's all over their gloved hands. And I'm like, no, this is not how we clean up the toilet. They had a bag full of it. And I, I was telling my friend Zach about that story afterwards because I just thought, isn't that so funny? Like, huh, how did they think that's how we get rid of this mess? And he said, but isn't that exactly what we do? When we have a sin in our lives or there's bondage in our lives or there's areas that need transformation, is that not exactly what we do? That instead of allowing it to be washed away by the blood of Jesus through the power of his resurrection, do we not try and clean ourselves up? And I said, that's exactly the temptation. Instead of turning to God, instead of turning to him and asking for him to, to, to powerfully clean us. We often try and wrestle ourselves free. We try and shake ourselves free. We try and behavior modify, try harder. How many times have we tried harder to overcome sin and found ourselves right back in the same place? Jesus died and resurrected to set us free. And I love in the, in the book of Romans how they explain the resurrection and the death of Jesus. Romans chapter six says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We've been crucified so that we're no longer enslaved to sin. In Jesus, we're crucified to no longer be enslaved for one who has died has been set free from sin. And it goes on. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. So it isn't this that we've died with Christ. We now live with him. It's a full package. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. 
For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. He's saying there's a correlation between the death and resurrection of Jesus and us, that we've died to sin and now we're resurrected alive to God. That God has brought our spiritually dead lives back to life. Jesus died to set us free. Are you walking in freedom? Are you experiencing the freedom that God gives? I want to challenge you. You cannot wrestle yourself free. It's not possible. I've tried it. Only when you bring that to Jesus can you find transformation. Because the same power that rose Jesus from the grave, it now lives in us, in Christ. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you passionately pursued us. God, I pray that you would help us to respond to that pursuit with faith. That if we're in the room and we don't know you, that you would help us respond with faith. And if we are in relationship with you and there are areas that we need to grow in, that you would help us to respond to your passionate pursuit of us today with faith. Jesus, we need your help. Apart from you, we can do nothing. So enable us to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm so happy that you're here to celebrate Easter with us, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, that he overcame sin and death. And I, I just wanted to pause and give us a challenge. Maybe you're here today, and this is the first time you've heard that, the news about Jesus' uh, forgiveness of your sins on the cross. And if that's you, um, I want to challenge you with just one thing. The word is surrender. You see, God doesn't call you to clean up and fix up your life before he'll accept you. He just wants you to surrender. And maybe during the message, as we unpacked God's word, you felt just some stirring in your heart from the Holy Spirit. I want to challenge you to respond to that with surrender. And if you don't know what that wrestling through surrendering your life looks like, we want to help you. And so on our website, familychurchweb.com slash news. You can go through a detailed explanation of what the gospel is and how we are to respond to the gospel by surrendering our lives in faith to Jesus. And we want to walk alongside you in this as well. So if that's you, would you please message us at info at familychurchweb.com so that we can be partners with you and community around you as you decide to make this decisive, eternal decision to say yes to the friendship of your creator. And then maybe you're here today and, and you know Jesus, you've had relationship with Jesus, but you're, you're um, forgetting about the power of the resurrection. I want you to know today is a day of celebration. That Jesus overcame sin and death. He died on the cross for your sins. This is an awesome thing that needs to be celebrated. So we want to challenge you to get together with somebody, get together with a group of people. Maybe it's a digital meeting or maybe it's in person, whatever that looks like for your context. But we want to challenge you to get together and share how God, how you have experienced the freedom, forgiveness, and friendship of your creator. Thank you again so much for joining us. We love you guys. And I hope to see you here next week.